Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the study. Um, Judges chapter 12. Uh, just finishing up a little bit with uh, Jephthah, and then we're going to begin uh, looking further. We'll see how where we get to today. But before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for our time to study together once again. We're thankful for each person here and those that watch these videos later. We know, Lord, that you are leading and guiding us. And we ask, Lord, that you can give us strength to follow where you lead. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can be here as we continue to look at our present situation as revealed in the book of Judges. We are amazed that we can see these things so clearly from your word that you've written these things for, for us, even though they have other applications. And we just pray, Lord, that um, you can correct any errors we may have, that you can strengthen us. Be with each person in their particular needs and um, be with us now as we study together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we, we had um, addressed this conflict with the Ephraimites and um, where we had placed it. I had looked at Judges, so I'm just telling you what I saw. Judges 12, verse 6, and we can see this represents December 6th. It also represents uh, the 1260. Um and when you see the 42,000 Ephraimites that fall in this conflict, we can see 42 represents 42 months, which is also 1260. Um, it also represents, of course, the 2520. But the focus here is uh, the 2520, which is the counterfeit 2520, the satanic covenant. And so, so that's, it is addressing the first 2520. And of course, we can see that with Ephraim, which is northern Israel. So it's northern Israel's 2520. And um, this Shibboleth, or Sibboleth, we can see as uh, a message that can only be understood and, and presented. That is, it could be framed correctly. Uh, by those that understand the message. So we know that there is a misspeaking or a misframing of this message. Now, to be very blunt, we believe that this misframing is existing within this movement, um, primarily in the misunderstanding or the lack of understanding of what we are studying right now that is understanding the lines and how God is leading this, this movement. Um, so, so we believe that we're at the point where this battle is about to occur. So we're, we know we're in this time where the conflict has occurred, but there is this battle. And we know after this battle, Jephthah judges Israel six years. And, um, and then Jephthah dies and is buried in one of the cities of Gilead, right? So that's the end of that story. Now, we can see there that the end of that story, if we read it in reverse, is July 21st, which is a symbol for midnight. Now, what about the six years? How, how do we address the six years? And, and even in these other things that we've been discussing, if anybody has points or questions. I mean, the one thing about the six years is we know that if we took that in prophetic years, that would be 2,160 days. Um, 
And that, of course, is a symbol dealing with the symbol of 666. Six times six times six is 216. Of course, that's once you take 360, that's 60 times six. So, um, but what could these, I mean, other than the Sunday law, because 666 represents the Sunday law, um, what does this say about the message of Jephthah and this conflict with the Ephraimites? Oh, in uh, twelve six, there you've got the. Oh, what was I going to say? Six times six times six. Yeah, I was thinking of of the two sixteenth of February sixteenth when you were booted off the three AMF. Yeah, uh, you know when. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, so there's lots in these symbols here, um, but this me message of Jephthah, it says which we're taking as the message of July 18th, that it has this period of six years, which we would um, take as referring to uh, starting now. I mean, I don't know if we would count six years into the future in some literal sense. I think we would look at it more symbolic so that this has to do with the Sunday law. Now, the other thing that I pointed out was that I could take 12-6 uh, as representing 12-26. Uh, that is the date, uh, February, or not February, December 26, which this line of studies um, began. And then we have an anniversary of December 26th. So on December 26th, we're going to have the two, two, 252nd study in this series of understanding the lines. So could we say that this message of Jephthah is not just about July 18th, but it's about the understanding of the study of the lines in relationship to uh, this movement? Because we're, we're looking at the message of Jephthah primarily as um, the message that happens at the end of these 300 years, right? Which is the 30 years. So we're saying that it's a message that relates to the 777 structure. <clears throat> So it's not just the message of July 18th. It's all of the, the things that come from the study of it. Are we accepting of that idea? Have we done anything, anything like that before? You know, normally take the 126, and then you have like 1226. Yeah. You're sort of equating it to being... A one, two, six. So I'm just thinking that to me seems like a new thought. Have we done anything to, double, to me? To double the number, but to double the number two? Yeah, something that's... Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm making a one, two, six, 12, 26. To me, it just seems a bit... Uh, Taking liberties. Okay. Well, I, I wouldn't definitely do that all on its own, right? So we we have the other thing is that it's 1226 is going to be the 250 second study. So that's a doubling of 126, right? Yes. Okay. Plus, we also know that um, from the study of Jephthah that it puts us into this conflict with Ephraim, right? So our studies have put us in conflict with Ephraim. 
And those studies started on December 26, 2021. And as we come to the anniversary of that, we're coming to um, the anniversary of that invitation that we made back in 2021. So when we made that invitation, we, we wanted the Canadian American group and everybody to work together in a study where we were going to, um, you know, review what, what had happened at the end of the 777 structure. And that invitation was rejected. They did not want to cooperate with anything we were doing. And so we worked around what, um, they had done and so we done did these meetings from the 24th to the 26th of 2021 and on the 26th we we actually began this study course of understanding the lines and so that anniversary is coming and it just happens to be the 252nd study uh but we can see also that in this study we now have an understanding of a message that differs from that of the American and Canadian group. So we have two different messages. They have a message that the Sunday law is coming right now, um, that uh, Trump's gonna be reelected. Not everybody in the American and Canadian group believe this necessarily, uh, but Trump's gonna somehow end up in power very soon in 2023, I guess, maybe in 2022. Um, and, and they don't care that it seems unlikely because they believe that prophecy points to it. So we need to have faith that it's going to happen. Um, and yet these are suggestions. Um, and it rejects, it rejects a basic understanding that we have of the lines, how they're typical. So, so I would think that this anniversary, the 24th, 25th, 26th, that's coming up um, would be important. In, in that sense. So, so even if we didn't take the 12, six and say that it's December 26th, we already have December 26th attached to that symbol. We, we would agree with that at least. Would you agree with that, Stephen? Yeah, I see your point. So all I'm doing is I'm just seeing that we have something there and that I can then take 12-6 and see that in 12-26, I have those three digits. And the number that's doubled there is the two and two represents a doubling. Plus we also have 12-6 doubled in the 252. So that's all I'm saying. I wouldn't have made, I wouldn't have taken that all by itself and, and tried to make that application. Um, you know, we know that we can switch numbers around, so we can know that uh, twelve six all can also can represent um, two sixteen, which is six times six times six. So um, the fact that we have the six years in the next verse, which is in a verse that is has a number of symbols. So twelve times seven is eighty four. That's on the eighteen forty three chart. We know it's also um, uh, the representation of 19 of the metonic cycle, which has 19 years, uh, seven of which are embolismic years. They have an extra month. Um, so that division occurs there. It's also a symbol then of the cross, right? Because it represents that um, <clears throat> the midst of the week, so, so we have that symbol. So there's many different things that we can look at at these two verses. Um, so obviously this shibboleth is, you know, something that people have noticed a long time ago. Um, but in this context, we're applying this here to this movement at this time. So if we were going to put this on a line, um, so I just took this line that I had before and, and just to go back. So, you know, we had, we had taken this, that 18 years and we had created this whole structure in our history that really deals with the message. 
of Jephthah that arises at the end of uh, this 18 year period, but it's more particularly involved here in this story of Ephraim. So we have again here this 30 years, we can see that this 777 days, which ended on December 25th, is then followed by these studies. So I could take uh, this and take this year. Now, Colin had marked, and I asked a question if anybody knew why Colin had marked December 25th, 2022. Um, I mean, it's an anniversary, of course, of December 25th, 2021. But it seemed that he had more in, in why he chose that. Uh, to put that date in his structure. And and he didn't really explain why. I mean, I understand. Okay, that's not working. I'll do this better. Okay. But nobody really knows why he put it there. But he has marked this anniversary. So we put one year here. Um, and what does a year represent? So if we're going to put a year here, because we have noted that we have these um, uh, some periods that are a year apart. Um, you know, for instance, in this chart we had uh, the time setting on six nine two thousand eighteen, uh, but we can take prophetic years and we mark them one year later six nine two thousand nineteen. Right, so that um, that becomes this one year anniversary in which we can extend these 18 prophetic years. Now, the 18 solar years ends at the closing of the door of Lambert Church from 9, 9 11. But this 18 prophetic years gives us this symbol of the date that we began time setting uh, one year later. So we have this idea of this anniversary. So what is this one year? I mean, I've noticed this in, in these lines right from the beginning when we started um, looking at them, that I could uh, find dates that were one year late. And so what could that possibly represent that we have these one year anniversaries? Um, now, when, is, when, is, when do we first get a year being mentioned as a, an anniversary as such? In the Bible. Anybody thought about this? Why this one year? Well, I don't know whether it's uh, the first mention, probably not, but uh, I'm just thinking about Daniel chapter 4. You have Nebuchadnezzar. Um, being prideful concerning the city and uh, Daniel he gets a, a warning to him one year before he actually becomes this this maniac you know before he becomes prideful not judgment in yeah. sense there's really? like a year yeah. there yeah okay so there we have a, a year anniversary uh, we have a year anniversary if you want to look at it with the flood um, it's going to give us this, the first time we get a period of a year, and that's going to be a year in Noah's life, though, um, you know, it's going to start sort of in the second month of his 600th year. And then uh, they're going to have the his birthday on the first day of the first month mentioned. So his 601st year. Um, and then it's going to go into the second month to end it. So um, I dealt with that in my new paper a little bit. But um, so we have this anniversary. So what would be uh, the idea of an anniversary? We also have with Abraham, uh, there's a one year anniversary from when he is given the promise that Isaac is going to be born and that Isaac is born. It, it occurs on the self same day. Um, so it's going to occur one year later to the day um so what would these one year anniversaries symbolize
Do we have any any way which we could take from these stories that have been mentioned? Could you relate to it as a day for a year? Okay, so that's that's how I understand it. That it relates to this day for a year, so that when God delays something for a year, it's relating to this idea of the day. That is, if we go from December 25th to December 25th, we're taking the day of December 25th and we're giving it a prophetic representation of a year. Does that make sense to people? And why would God do this? Why would we have this in our line if it does make sense? Could we look at, for instance, the invitation that we did in 2021 as really, we looked at it as, we're going to have these meetings on the 25th. But can we see that, that God has actually given us a year instead of a day? And that in this year, we have been studying, understanding the lines. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Because hasn't this really been an invitation this whole time, this whole year? The invitation was never withdrawn. Right. Now, now we can close it up, I guess, with this invitation again. Um, but yes, we, we've... We're more, uh, I guess, certain about what we're doing in this invitation. Does that make sense? I don't know if that's the right word. But you know, we we've we in a sense made a stand back in 2021. Would it be better to say certain or settled? Yeah, maybe settled is better. We we just have way more evidence for for what we're doing. Right for how we're understanding these lines, for the positions that we've taken. I mean, we've had so much evidence. I mean, it's 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 extremely remarkable how much we have found in this past year in these studies. And some of the th these things are extremely profound and have an effect not just for this movement, uh, but for actually understanding many things in the Bible, such as you know, the paper that I'm working on right now, dealing with the timing of first fruits and, and chronology. We've had these, these things that people have never noticed because they haven't taken the time to do the painstaking work of all this detail of chronology. And so, so we, we believe that this chronology that, that we've been given is, is purposely designed by God to help this movement at this time, right? So it's not just, you know, it's not, we're not just studying biblical chronology. We are, and we have these witnesses that address um, that other Christians and other Adventists could look at and, and understand, but it's, um, but it's, God has been doing this for us. Because we need direction at this time. And, you know, the question, I guess, that people would have to ask, is chronology um, the correct way to, is it an objective way to sort through what is true and what is not true? Because what people would argue is that um, this chronology that we're doing is just uh, subjective, right? It's just, a, and it's a creation of man. We're sort of manipulating things to understand uh, 
our history and that we need to listen to, we need to study some other way. But we know that this movement was founded upon line upon line, which is to set waymarks on a line. These waymarks are the plummet, their righteousness, and the line is judgment. And if this movement is, is properly founded at all, uh, we would have to continue following that, that line of study, right? I, I don't know how we could escape it. I don't know how we could argue against what we've found. I mean, you could ignore it, but I don't think we could argue against it. Right. And if you could, I mean, I think people would, would try, but I, I haven't seen, I haven't seen in this movement, even presently, but even in the past, for those that have rejected our method of study using chronology, I have not seen people actually try to address it other than basically straw man arguments and um, uh, attacking the man, right? So either you, you attack the person, his character or something like that, or you just create false arguments. But, but I've tried, you know, to see how can we refute this? And I just don't see how we can. Okay, I'm going to give an example of what, you know, where, where some are trying to refute different portions. On Facebook, there is a party that identifies himself as William Miller. Now, yeah. that's not, it's not his name. Mm -hmm. The other day, he, pl he placed a post on Facebook stating that you cannot prove October 22nd, 1844 from the Bible. Okay. Um, well, that's crazy. Well, there were many that decided to argue with him and say that he was incorrect. And yet he wasn't accepting anyone's point. Mm -hmm. He was still standing that you cannot show October 22nd, 1844 from the Bible alone. Well, I mean, it, I mean, it's kind of true. You do need history. I mean, you to put a date in history, I mean, you need something to anchor it on. But, but, but you use the Bible to, to show the connections with history. So you're using the Bible. I mean, um, but what is he trying to say uh, particularly? Anyway, I know you have a point with it. Well, his, the, the point that this man was trying to make was that you cannot use sola scriptura to prove this point. Now, Father Miller was very direct in the way that he was approaching a lot of different things. And one of the main points that we have used as foundational to addressing mm -hmm. October 22nd, 1844, is the fact that we have this message of warning that was given through Isaiah that can clearly be established historically because of the, the different number of kings that are mentioned and when they basically had all reigned at a specific time. Now, there are many that wish to put aside the study of anything having to do with chronology. Mm -hmm. Well, if we're putting aside chronology, like in the case here that was mm -hmm. posted on Facebook, yeah, then how is a party to establish 
when Christ's advent with the Jewish people was to come. We can establish directly from the Bible that I believe it was Simeon and Anna both understood the time in which the Savior was going to come to this earth. Mm -hmm. They had to understand it based upon their understanding of history and chronology together. Mm -hmm. Now, our, our points right now are based upon an understanding of what the different lines and the different books of the Bible are showing to us. Mm -hmm. We're going to have points that are based directly upon the recent history that we have been living through. Mm -hmm. We can either choose to accept them or we are going to be rejecting them. I think we reject them at our peril. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think there's just too much evidence. The, the things that we have found to say that this is sort of some kind of uh, this deception uh, because it, it answers to God's word. It gives us insight into God's word. So we're not, we're not creating some speculative, theories like you know lunar sabbaths or something that you can't base on the bible that you're going to base upon all kinds of speculative theories this, we're not using speculative theories everything that we've done has come from a study of god's word now it may seem weird to people when they see what we're doing here but this but this is this is methodical bible study that has been developed over years, you know, starting with Jeff, and even we can we will also go back to Millerite history and, and and other histories too. This is something that has developed, it's grown in its its ability to be precise. Right. So we 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 can be precise about the timing of uh, when the manna first fell. And when it ceased falling. But nobody else can do that. Right. So at this time, we've been given these very precise tools. I don't see how we can ignore them. And dismiss them, which which is what I think is happening from my perspective. OK, now, in in a way of looking at this. What was yesterday? I um, mean, the, the, the date? Just in, in general, what was yesterday? Well, yesterday was Wednesday. Okay. Yesterday was Wednesday. Yeah. It was the 7th of December of 2022. Yeah. Yesterday because we cannot put a finger on it, never existed. Is that a fair statement? No. Okay. In the same manner, many of these that are choosing to say that we cannot accept chronology mm -hmm. are trying to say, because I cannot touch this, because I cannot lay a finger upon this because I cannot hold it in my hand, therefore it does not exist. Mm -hmm. Now, if we were to look at yesterday in history, what was yesterday? Well, it was the, the anniversary of the bomb. Pearl Harbor. Pearl exactly. Harbor. It was also my ex-wife's um, uh, birthday. So. Okay. <laughs> but it was also 12-7. Exactly. Right. So it was it was twelve seven. And and that's a symbol um for midnight. Mm 
especially if and so it's the opposite of your birthday in the sense if you took your birthday and wrote it backwards uh july 21st it would be uh 12 7 right now right now we have those that would look to twist the understanding of what's happening currently. Mm -hmm. They're not okay. really they're currently in our studies, too. Repeat, please. Well, they're currently in our studies. Well, I'm more referring to the point that we have those that would say that because July 18th failed, mm -hmm. we need to set additional dates that will not fail. Did we not, as we have studied the Millerite time, mm -hmm. Did we not observe that this same situation occurred with those that were part of the Millerite movement, but that this occurred subsequent to the 22nd of October of 1844? Yeah. And so, so, and we pointed out from early writings, page 74, that that time setting that she's talking about still is in effect because it applied to them. Right. And it applies to us as a parallel to July 18th because we're exactly. We're, so we know, though, that we're not setting time. We're watching and waiting. Watching and waiting does not mean ignoring what's happening around you. It's actually watching. So by measuring the time, by putting these dates down, that's part of watching and waiting, isn't it? Right. Ellen White's not saying you ignore dates completely or you ignore time completely or you ignore the signs of the times. You just don't try to predict when things are going to occur. Right? You're not going to set a date for the second coming of Christ, which is what they were trying to do. And and then she goes on in other places to show that, you know, any promise of special significance we can't know when that's going to occur we can't know when the latter rain is going to be poured out now it doesn't mean we can't know afterwards right and it doesn't mean that we 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 don't look for the symbols of those occurrences to know that something has occurred right so we've been given chronology as a witness in the old testament and in the new testament and in Millerite history, and in this movement. So, you know, we can't afford to ignore what's been unfolding to this, to this movement in these studies. And so this invitation has to go out to those in this movement in some way that they're going to look at it, even if they're just going to go and start watching these studies from the beginning, from December 26th. 2021 and go back and review it but i mean what we have to do is give a review of what we have found uh, you know starting on the 24th All right we we need to give we need to give that review and and make an invitation for that because we found so much that needs to be understood by this movement. Now, um, so the Ephraimites, what is their contention when we go back to Judges 12? Isn't their contention this time the same as it was with Gideon? Right. So, so we had this invitation were they invited? Yes. Yeah, in both cases, they were invited, weren't they? Right. Right. So, but they're claiming that they they weren't. Is that what they're saying? 
I would say that that's correct. I believe that's what we established as we went through the study with Gideon. Yeah. So, so can we look at the invitation that was given in the story of Gideon to relate more to the first invitation and this one relate to the second invitation? Agreed. Okay. So that means, because what I'm trying to establish is, should we be inviting people? Should we be taking the position that we're doing this time? Well, if we're looking at this in the book of Judges as being a message. Yeah. I agree. It is a message. Are we not being given a pattern in what happened with Gideon and what's happening here with Jephthah? Mm-hmm. I think we're going to wind up giving this invitation and we're going to be in the same pattern as is being established here within this book. Okay. The difference is that with Gideon, he gave an invitation. He gave a message. Jephthah here is trying to give a very soft answer, but they're not willing to listen. Mm -hmm. Are they? No. Okay. And what happens? Well, they end up in a battle. Yeah. 42,000 Ephraimites are killed. So... We're not looking to place a sword between us and other brothers and sisters. But this message, this 42 months, 42,000, 1260, however we want to see it, Mm -hmm. is going to cause a division. Mm -hmm. And this message of Jephthah continues in connection with the Sunday law. Correct. So the six years to me represent the Sunday law. And um, yeah, so so to me, it seems, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty certain of it, that our studies are correct and that those that aren't going to accept these studies um are doing so at their own peril. Agree. Look at it. If they're not going to study it, if they're not going to to study and try to find whether something is so or not, uh, even though they're giving a message about the Sunday law, in the end, they will be on the wrong side of the Sunday law. Because you can't ignore and reject light and expect that at some point you're just going to turn around and act differently. It just doesn't work that way. So and and Jephthah is you know means to open, right? So so this is this message has been opened up, light has been opened up for this movement. You can't ignore that light. Correct. And this and this message leads to symbolically the midnight cry. It most definitely leads to the midnight cry. I mean, what else would it lead to? Yeah, but Judges 12-7 is, is that midnight cry. And, and that's what this movement is about, right? So, so we know we have these dates in the future, whatever they mean particularly. We know they're symbolic. Um, and they're for us. And so exactly when that midnight, well, midnight, I guess, particularly July 21st, you know, whenever that is, when, whenever that 
that event comes, whatever line that's in. Uh, I would assume that, you know, this is about the message to the Levites and that this movement is connected to giving a message to the Levites. So if we're going to believe Jeff's message, we can't be trying to establish it upon a false interpretation of prophecy. That actually just undermines it. Correct. And, and so we believe early writings, page 74, represents the difference between what we have been doing and what the American and Canadian groups have been doing in their study. And there's a difference between those two groups. Um, I would say that um, the American group, from my understanding of what I see them interested in and the comments that they make, that they would be more in line with the first day Adventists. And the Canadian group, what they're doing is more in line with those that uh, were time setting. Is that a fair? I think that's a very direct analogy. Yeah. Okay. Is that that's what I see happening, and I don't see that these two groups can continue working together, especially after Collins' failed prediction. I don't think that there is the sympathies. With Colin, one is people don't know him in the American group personally, uh, but also just with how he is studied and and the, the failure of that message. I don't think they're going to go along with his ideas that these were just suggestions. And, and I know Daniel Fontenot isn't leaning that direction. Because right? he's much more founded upon traditional conservative Adventism. And, and he doesn't like, you know, the things that have been happening. Now, he, he accepts July 18th in a sense, but I don't think he really does. But, you know, this is just my observations. Based on his studies, he accepts it because he needs to accept it. But I don't think he accepts how we arrived at it. So, but that's just, that's just my, my observations, whether they're correct or not, I don't know. <clears throat> so any other final thoughts? So all I'm doing here, now if I'm going to go back to this diagram. Um, so all I'm doing here is I'm putting in this one year, but, but I probably should put in the six years as well. But the six years are not leading us to a date. They're just leading us to an event, and that is midnight. Right. So, so that means that this movement, what we've been studying, all this chronology, is leading us to that point. And we can see that, of course, that's ultimately where the movement has to, to go especially if we're dealing with July 18th, because we know July 18th is three days before midnight. Samuel Snow's last letter is published three days before he presents at Boston. And that three days is an important symbol. We have it in the story of Ezra. Of course, we have it in the story of Christ. We have it all through the Bible. And so now we, we have this, this message of July 18th that's connected to three days before midnight. And it's really the prediction before midnight, which is what all of this July 18th has been about. It's, so July 18th isn't, isn't really typifying October 22nd in the ultimate sense. It's not in a direct sense. It's indirectly through Samuel Snow's July 18th prediction before midnight and that prediction before midnight which is the confirming of the covenant the title of that article that's published on july 18th that article uh, marks july 18th in our time so july 18th in our time is typifying something that's going to happen 
It's not the actual thing. So we know that July 18th, what we experienced, we're going to experience again in reality. We haven't. So if we haven't experienced midnight yet in reality, we can't, we can't be in the Sunday law yet in that sense. I mean, we know our whole line is, when we zoom in, it's all the Sunday law way mark. But we can't be, we can't be having the Sunday law here in 2022 or 2023, if all we've experienced is our typical events. Right. And, and that mostly related to us internally, to this movement. And so the movement needs to know this. I mean, I remember back in 2021, near the end there, um, you know, a few months before the end, I mean, there was talk, and even when I talked to Colin on, on the phone one time, I can't remember the date, but he says, yeah, you need to present what you've been finding. You need to present it to this movement for them to hear it. But, of course, that never happened. No. Um, and, and a lot of this was just personal feelings, feelings being hurt. It was not um, a biblical discussion to decide whether something was true or not. Right. And there was this projection that I was the one that was causing this conflict. But that was simply just projection. You know, I wasn't in a conflict with anybody, any person. I was just addressing ideas that we needed to study, points that we needed to address. And so, you know, so this movement is in this situation because people have not been willing to follow the councils in the spirit of prophecy when a brother differs. And I believe that we have been following that counsel. And, you know, we want to continue following that counsel. So, so I think the, the message of Jephthah comes at the right time for us. And that's what I was talking about, the timing of in this movement. So here we come along, um, you know, and we're studying verse 12, verse 6, and 12, verse 7 on December 6th and December 7th, right? Leading up to understanding that we have to deliver a message in this conflict. So, I mean, just the timing of what we are studying um, to me is remarkable because it's definitely not planned by anybody. I mean, if my plans had worked out, we would have been done this study, you know, um, eight months ago. Yeah, and, and Angela points out Jephthah is vindicated in Hebrews 11.32, along with Gideon and the others, Samson. So, um, and, and, and that's a really important point, because remember what uh, Colin was presenting in one of his studies not long ago about the just shall live by faith. So if we go there, if we go here to Hebrews chapter 11, what, what is faith according to Hebrews 11? Substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Okay, so, what faith, not by so what does that mean? The substance of things hoped for. Well, it's reality. We we trust in the reality of God and what he's revealing to us. So faith is based upon reality, not upon fantasy or wishful thinking. And and it is the evidence of something, things that, yeah, so Pearl Harbor was 700 or 77 years ago as of yesterday, 
right? Because that was um, uh, 77. 77? That's not right, because it was in 41, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay, so it's not 77. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My bad. I was yeah. thinking of Hiroshima. Yeah, you're thinking of Hiroshima. Yeah, because Hiroshima was uh, the result, partly, of a response to what happened at the bombing of Pearl Harbor. I mean, obviously, there's other things that happened afterwards, but um, those two events are tied together. Yeah, so... Yeah, so it's not 77, it's then 81. Right. right. And what's the significance of 81? Midnight. Yeah. Okay. So there we go in, in tying that together because we already tie that to midnight. Okay. But see, th this is just not that we have tied it to midnight. Elder Jeff tied this to midnight. Yeah. Elder Jeff made it very clear that 81, as in the 81st year with Mrs. White, mm -hmm. was a midnight when she spoke before the general conference. Yeah. 81 as a symbol being that of midnight, we can point to in several different manners and several different ways. Yeah. 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 So... So here we have this, this symbol, which um, ties into the actual date. But so when we say the faith is the substance, it's the reality of things that are hoped for. It's the evidence of things that are not seen. So faith is the witness. It's the evidence of things that are not seen. So faith is not just believing in something. Because you could believe in things that are not true. And what would that be? Falsehoods. Well, it would, if you're believing in something that's not true, that's just presumption. Correct? Exactly. But it's also that's like right. knowledge. What's that, William? I was disagreeing with you. Okay. And Dwight? I just said it's idolatry. Yeah. Okay. Well, it is idolatry, but when we have the evidence of things that are not seen, those things still exist. Right. Just because something isn't seen doesn't mean it's not real. Right. So, I mean, we have evidence for things that are not seen. That is, we have evidence. We know that they exist because there's evidence that they exist, even though we cannot see them either yet or they are things that are invisible right but something that's invisible exists right correct god is invisible but he exists what do we breathe air okay but i can't see it yeah so how do we know it's there well there's evidence that it's there i mean can you touch it well, sort of. I mean, I can wave my hand in the air and I can, you know, feel the air rush by when I'm driving in a car. You can also see the trees when they move. But Jesus says, you know, the wind bloweth where it will, but you cannot see where it comes from or where it's going. So is everyone that is born of the spirit. Now, the word wind and spirit in the Greek are the same words. So I'm, I'm just I'm making a. You know, one of these fallacious, fallacious arguments. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> yeah, I understand what you're doing. So um, now when we, when we look at it, it says, for by it the elders obtained a good report. So he's talking about those in the past. They had true faith, even though often they didn't demonstrate it. And he also says, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. And so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. That is, we know that everything that we see um, is pretty much empty space, even, even a solid table. It's the magnetic fields uh, between uh, the atoms that actually make something appear solid. But most of 
everything that we see is actually empty between these atoms there is nothing um, and these atoms even though they're fairly close together i mean they're very 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 tiny so there's much more space than there is substance but the thing is it's real things that are seen are made of things which do not appear so these things these atoms they're not visible but the things that that we see are made of those things that's that's what paul is saying here plus we also understand that that god created the world based upon his word he spoke it into existence this is all through the old testament and then he starts listing off all of these people who had faith and their faith is founded on something right they're not it's not these weren't people who just made things happen because they they believed something that wasn't true and it became true it's not like wishful thinking or magic they had confidence in god their faith was faith in god's word that created things and brought them into existence right so this is all in response to god's word now um so, you know, there's there's lots to this, all these different things, the walls of Jericho. And we could go through all of these events. And and really, these are events that we can all put on a line. Right. Every single one of these events is part of a line. Right. Right. So so Paul is laying out here line upon line. Demonstrating the everlasting gospel. And then he's going to say, what shall I more say? That's verse 32. For time would fail to tell um, of Gideon or of, and of Barak and of Samson and Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets. So it would fail me to tell of these, these people, right? And then he's going to list all of these things. They subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire. Escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned the flight of the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted tormented of whom the world was not worthy they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth these all having obtained a good report through faith received not the promise so these people did they see the end result of what they were believing in I mean, there's obviously a few exceptions here because we know, you know, Enoch was translated and Moses was resurrected. But in the general sense of all, these people received a good report through faith. But did they see the fulfillment of the promise? No, they did not. And if we were to add... You know, the Millerites in here who believed that Jesus was going to return. Did any of them see that promise fulfilled? So if we if we don't receive the promise, if July 18th doesn't happen the way we expect or Donald Trump, you know, doesn't appear in our mind to be the 45th and last president of the United States. Something went amiss. It's true that we have to believe in faith, that the just shall live by faith. But we know that by reinterpreting uh, that prediction about Donald Trump is not the correct way. That's not really faith, is it? 
those that were time setting after 1844, was it faith that was causing them to time set? No, it was pride. Pride and presumption. That is, we can believe in God's promises even if we don't see them fulfilled. And we established something. Trump was the last president of the United States. And we have an answer to that because that answer has to do with the typical nature of our line and what January 6th means. And if you accept January 6th, you can't possibly uh, suggest that Trump has to be, pre uh, be president again in order for that prediction to have been correct. We can't say that we made a mistake in that sense. We can't look for a new time. We can't look for a new date for July 18th and say, well, you know, that date was wrong. Or we are wrong about Trump, so, you know, now it has to be fulfilled in some other way. Because we weren't wrong. We just didn't understand which line we were in. And that line was meant to correct us. That's the message of Jephthah. It's meant to correct us. Not to, to flatter us. Or to vindicate us. Because when does the vindication of God's people occur? When can we ever expect to be vindicated? Even, even when we are preaching that message, when we're lifted up as an enzyme, are we vindicated? No. No, we're, we're, we are being treated as these people listed here have been treated. And yet we think that the world is somehow going to accept us. And all that's being offered to us is persecution. To be destitute afflicted and tormented that is what we are are to expect as followers of christ correct right and so if we we appear in the eyes of the world to have been in error with july 18 or with the trump prediction and we think somehow that you know Trump getting elected now is, is going to vindicate us, even if he was elected again in 2024. Um, it wouldn't really vindicate us, would it? No. So, so that's the problem that this movement faces right now, is we don't understand our message. And... I don't know what's going to happen as far as this movement is concerned, but I do know it can't exist in the state that it is now. It's too fractured. And if the disciples after the crucifixion had not gone to the upper room, if they hadn't examined their hearts, if they hadn't looked at the evidences that Christ presented from the scriptures, there would be no Christian church. And if there was, they wouldn't have been a part of it. So we know now where, where we're at. We're at that point after the cross. We're, we're the Millerites after October 22, 1844. The ones who accept that Christ has become the high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. And there's just 50 of them studying together, you know, six years later in, in 1850, studying out and trying to understand their message. They're going to become a worldwide movement. So when we look at this situation, this is not about 
numbers. It's not about, you know, any position that we've had in the past. It's about whether we're willing to follow God now. And, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm definitely convinced that everything that we have studied in the last year is solid. So, you know, so this is, this is what the message of Jephthah is about. It's this message of righteousness by faith. But it has to be faith. It can't be presumption. Now, we're just going to, we don't have a lot of time. we got about 15 minutes. We can start on this next section if we're done with that. Um, but we're going to have Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon. And after him, Ibzan of Bethlehem judged Israel. He had 30 sons and 30 daughters whom he sent abroad and took him 30 daughters from abroad for his sons. And he judged Israel seven years. And then died Ibzan and was buried in Bethlehem. And after him, Elon, the Zeb, Zebulonite, judged Israel and judged Israel 10 years. And Elon, the Z Zebulonite, died and was buried in Agilon in the country of Zebulon. And after him, Abdon, the son of Hillel, a Pirathonite, judged Israel. And he had 40 sons and 30 nephews that rode on threescore and ten ass colts. And he judged Israel eight years. So one of the things we noted about these three judges, what is the symbol that is attached to them? You mean beside the, uh, the asses that are attached here? Yeah, yeah, just the time symbols, the number symbols. I mean, there's lots of them, but we have seven, ten, and eight, right? Right. So that's July 18. That's July 18, correct? So, so we see July 18 is tied up here in these three. Now it mentions these three. So what what why these three? Why are they grouped together? And they have some um, some other symbols. We of course we know with Ibzen, he's got the 30 sons and 30 daughters, and then um and took in daughters, so there's uh, three, 30, 30, and then 30. What's that? Rather busy. Yeah. Okay, and then and then you're going to have Elon the Zebulonite, and, and it doesn't really say too much about him. It's just that he uh, judged Israel 10 years. Okay, but let's He's go back to Zebulun. Ibsen. What's that? Okay. Go back to Ibsen for a moment. Yeah. He's from where? Uh, Bethlehem. And Bethlehem means? Well, the house of bread. So this is the this is the city in which Christ is born. Yeah. This is the house of bread. Mm -hmm. It would be it would have been interesting had this been the house of manna, but this is the bread that comes from God. Yeah, the bread that comes down from heaven. So here is the bread from the living bread. So what kind of food is this? Is this not ordained of God? In this study, symbolically? Mm -hmm. But, but... Yeah, so part of what I take with this, so when I look at the bread, the house of bread, and we know that Christ is the bread that came down from heaven, and that the manna from the time that it was first given to when it ceased was 14,588 days, and we had used this November 24th date um, symbolically, and it brought us back to April 26th, uh, 1990, with this 1,190 days. Um, we had the 14,588 days bringing us to April 5th, 2030. 
So one of the things I see about this, this symbol of this judge is it's a message that um, addresses, um, well, one is he judges Israel seven, seven years, right? But he's from the house of Bethlehem. So that's, that's the symbol of the manna, right? Okay. Okay. And then the 30 sons and the 30 daughters. And remember, we had in the story of Ezra, the 30, right? And 30 represents the number of days in a month. And we have this triple here, 30, 30, and 30, right? Right. So, so that also represents the three days in the story of Ezra. And we have that 30-day that symbol, the number of, of months, um, that happens in that 88 days. You know, we, we tied that into April 5th, 2030 as well. So one of the things I see about these three judges is they represent this message after the message of Jephthah that is looking forward uh, prophetically based upon July 18th as a symbol, leading us to whatever that symbolic date means in the future. But there, there are three judges here to, to create this July 18 symbol. So these are messages that are progressive. Now, um, you know, we don't have a lot of time. We still got about 12 minutes though. Um, so we're going to look at this in more detail, but right now, just looking at what we had done before, we had looked at um, Ibzan, um, his name means splendid, right? Right. We obviously see the symbol of, um, that you're going to find in the fourth one, the Zebulonite, um, that they have these ascoles. So we're going to see the symbol of Islam. So we know that that's going to be part of our message again. Um, yeah, so his name has two meanings, illustrious and splendid, and um, um, what was the other thing there you're saying there, Angela, about Abdon means a servant, Elon means an oak, okay, yeah, so Now, so Ibzan's buried in Bethlehem, right? And then we have Elon. Now he's a Zebulonite, so he's from Zebulun. And what was the point of Zebulun? What is Zebulun about? Doesn't he ha have something further to do with uh, the ass? Um, yeah, so if we go... So if we go to Genesis chapter, um, what Jacob says about, we know Issachar is a strong ass couching down between two burdens. And uh, where's Zebulun? Yeah, Zebulun shall dwell in the haven of the sea. He shall be a haven for ships and his border shall be unto Zidon. So if it's having to deal with ships, that's economics. Okay. That's yeah. Okay. So what application would you make of that? Well, if his haven is the sea, the sea is peoples, but it's also it also has something to do with the economics because doesn't the ships of Tarshish have something to do with the economics at the end of the world? Yeah. So, so they could or be ships of Chittim. Chittim. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Ships of Chittim. Yeah. But yeah, so ships represent economics.
Now we also had Zebulun. That was uh, a date that went from uh, the Seventh Day Adventist Church, May twenty third, eighteen sixty three, to July eighteen, twenty twenty. Right. So that's going to be the the tribe. So the numbering of the tribe of Zebulun is fifty seven thousand four hundred. And um, so Adelio had applied this numbering of Zebulun to to July 18. So again, we have with uh, being a Zebulonite, that ties us to July 18. Right? Okay. And... Um, and then we have Abdon, the son of Hillel, um, which means a servant. And he had 40 sons and 30 nephews. So we have this 4-3 combination, right? To make, right. Seven, to make 70 or 7, as we see in many of the, the prophecies in Revelation. The group does 4 and 3. And, th and this happens other places too. And, and then it's going to be 70... Um, ass cults. So we know this is the symbol of Islam. And he judged Israel eight years. Now, now when we deal with these periods of time, um, eight years, I mean, you know, the natural thing is to try to, to say, can we put this in? Um, yeah, so you could scramble 547 is 457. I don't know if I'd make that as the main application, but it definitely uh, could apply. So the Zebulonite, Zebulonites, he dies. He's buried in Agilon. Now, Agilon is um, the field of deer. You know, I always think of sun stand thou still upon Gibeon and thou moon in the valley of Agilon. Every time I see Agilon, I always think of that. Um, so we have um, each of these these symbols, and a pyrethonite. Um, so that's an inhabitant of pyrethon, uh, but that word itself. Um, comes from this idea of a chieftaincy, right? So somebody who's a chief. So he's a servant in his name, but he's a chief. But does he's, that not give a symbol of he that would be first must be last? That's exactly what I was going to say. Scary. will be first. Yeah. yeah. Now he's he's um, buried in the land of Ephraim in the Mount of the Amalekites. So, um, I don't know if we have anything about. Um, I mean, I assume he's going to be an Ephraimite, but so anyway, we can see that there's there's these symbols here attached to these judges, and if we were going to place them, um, they would be after the message of Jephthah, whatever that means. Right. That is, we're not we're not taking these and having them go back to the past, even though they have the symbols of July 18th. This this isn't the message of July 18th before July 18th. Right. This this shows the message that's continuing on. So, you know, my understanding is that this message of Jephthah. It's it's going to continue obviously, um, because it's it's connected to the Sunday law. But these other symbols are also here attached to messages. 
Now, we don't have here any particular enemies. These are just going to be the judges. So after Jephthah dies, we have Ibsen. He's a judge. Doesn't say anything about anybody that they're fighting against. They're just under judges at this time. Right? They're not kings, right? They don't uh, have their sons follow them. They don't have a, a monarchy, right? They're just judges that God raises up at various times. So, so we would expect that these messages relate to um, uh, what we have been studying and what we believe that is coming, um, but they're not fighting a particular enemy that's mentioned. But we have these symbols here of Islam, the symbols here that lead us to understand April 5th, 2030, in its connection with July 18. Any any other observations about these three judges? From the description with Ibsen, mm -hmm. it would seem that that he was working somewhat toward the northeast of Israel, if what is in the uh, the notes of the translators is correct. Okay, what do they say? that Ibsen seems to be a civil judge to do justice in Northeast Israel. Okay. Now, they say the same thing about Elon for Northeast Israel, and they say the same thing for Abdon. I'm, you know, I'm kind of intrigued with the situation with Ibsen because it gives us description that he had 30 sons and 30 daughters whom he sent abroad and he took in 30 daughters from abroad for his sons yeah it doesn't say anything about the sons for his daughters well no but he sends them out they get married somewhere else i mean i would assume it's going to be 30 uh, since his 30 daughters are sent abroad, I, I think that would mean that they're married out. But isn't this another example of something that is there but is hidden? Yeah. yeah. Another thing interesting in, in um, so in the notes, um, that I have here from the translators. It says AM 2840 BC, um, 1164. So they're using Usher's dates. Right. And then it says um, AN, EX, IS, which I don't know what those are abbreviations for. And then it says 327. Interesting. Yeah. So do you because know what those abbreviations are? I don't know what the abbreviations are, but the 327, if you place that in a different order, gives you the 273 that we've talked oh. about before. Yeah. It's March 27th, third, 27th day of the third month. It's 273, yeah. So I don't know why they have that number there. Anyway, thanks for the study, everyone. We're going to have to close with prayer. And We'll pick this up, um, but, you know, we're obviously pretty much done that section. And then we're going to have to deal with Samson, this ironic uh, character, and put him on the line. But I, I think all I would do is that I would put this, these three judges into 2023. Um, that's where they continue on, because the book of Judges is just giving us the history up until then. I mean, it does connect with April 5th, 2030, but it doesn't. That's anything really um, regarding what's going to happen. It's just telling us about what we need to do now and that this message will continue in the symbol of these three messages, which I think are probably three parts of a message, a threefold message, the everlasting gospel that's uh, being given. So, well, is this also not 
part of a three-step prophetic testing message. Yeah, which is the everlasting gospel. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so that's that's how I take these three judges. Anyway, let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, once again, we are always amazed at what we find in your word as we follow the counsel and how we study. Lord, we have a burden upon our heart for this movement, for this message, for the people in it. We know, Lord, that many of these are our friends and the people that we love and care for. And um, even ones that we hardly know, we, we want to see them uh, accept the truth and follow you. So, Lord, we lift them all up in prayer. Um, we know that we have this responsibility before us. So we ask that we can fulfill our responsibility in inviting people to this message. Show us how to do it uh, with tact and um, help us, Lord, ourselves to be truly converted. Give us for our sins. Help us to trust in you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.